It's time for our first speaker session. Our first speaker session is called Reimagining Our Relationship to the Land. Our first speaker is Kellen LaCour Conant, Coastal Resources Scientist at the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority of Louisiana. Kellen is a wetland scientist and daughter of Isle Bravel. After having worked in restoration ecology for 10 years, she's knowledgeable about many different ecosystems and traditional relationships with nature. She grew up learning about wildlife from her family and went on to earn a bachelor's in biology from Amherst College and a master's in marine and environmental biology from Nichols State University. She now works for CPRA in Baton Rouge to advance Louisiana's comprehensive master plan for a sustainable coast. Please welcome Kellen. Am I on? Great. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to admit it's a little intimidating being the first speaker of the day. Um, but seeing everyone out here and hearing y'all's applause, I'm just really excited to be here. Uh, thank you for coming and spending your day with us. And thank you again for the Idea Fest crew for making this happen. So let's get another round of applause. Before I jump into my presentation, I wanted to take a beat to acknowledge that the land that we call Kentucky are the traditional homelands of the Shawnee, Cherokee, Chickasaw, Chickasaw, and Osage nations. And as we reflect on today's themes of land and legacy, we should confront the realistic truth that not all of the legacies that we inherit are ones that we want to continue into the future. So those legacies of hurt towards others or destruction of the environment, we don't have to take that into our future. We have the power today to build better legacies. So as you're listening to the speakers today and learning out in the hands-on sections, I want you to challenge yourselves to envision what type of future you want to see and how we can work together to make that happen. So togetherness is really important for me. Uh, first off, I'm a people person, so I like being near people. And secondly, I'm an ecologist. What an ecologist is, is someone who studies the connections between living things like plants, animals, and people, and non-living things like soil, air, water, all that stuff, and how they're connected in ways that affect the health of both of them. So I'm specifically a restoration ecologist, which is like a little subsect of ecology, and it's about mending those connections. Because if you have one link that's out of whack in the chain or something's failing over here, that might affect the health of the entire system and we're not able to live in harmony. So as I go through my presentation, I want you all to keep that big picture in mind of restoring our connections to each other and our environment and trying to find some sense of harmony in how we live. Scroll, please. So I will give you some real life examples about what I do, like how I get dirty in the mud and plant plants and all that good stuff. But I wanted to share a little story with y'all because who doesn't like a good story? My family's from Louisiana and in Louisiana we have these folk tales. It's called Compère Bouquet and Compère La Pomme, which is Brother Hyena and Brother Rabbit. So they're kind of like the Louisiana Tom and Jerry a little bit. You know, they have these mischievous antics, they're always trying to pull tricks on each other. But in the end, we end up learning some lessons from their antics. So one of my favorite stories um, starts with the children of Compère Bouquet. They go out and they see the children of Compère Le Pan dressed in these fancy new clothes. They run to Compère Bouquet and say, Father, why don't we have fancy new clothes like the children of Compère Le Pan? Compère Bouquet goes to Compère Le Pan and says, where did you get these fancy new clothes? I know you don't have the money to be buying your kids all these fancy new things. Where did you find all this stuff? And after a lot of badgering and nagging and annoying Compère Le Pan, Compère Le Pan finally says, okay, okay, I'll tell you. Scroll, please. <laughs> Go out into the woods and cut some wood. Oh, okay. Go out into the wood and cut some wood. And then when you're tired, go find the biggest tree you can find in the middle of the forest and take a nap. When you wake up refreshed and restored, say thank you to the tree, and it'll open up, and you'll find anything that you could want. Once you find what you need, give thanks, ask the tree to let you out, and you're free. 
And so Compare Bouquet does what Compare Le Pan says. He goes out and cuts some wood, finds a tree, takes a nap, thanks the tree, goes inside, and he's amazed by all the treasures that he finds. So amazed that he wants to just take everything he can find. And he's so distracted, he doesn't realize that some thieves came into the tree while he was trying to gather up everything. These thieves used the tree as their hiding spot, and they were not happy to find Compere Bouquet there. So they kick him out of the tree as hard as they can, so hard that he loses all of his spots. And it takes him weeks to go run around the forest trying to find his spots again. Scroll, please. So what does that story mean? The obvious answer is don't be greedy. Um, but it also teaches us a lesson about reciprocity with our environment. Compare Le Pan said, you know, you can go out to the forest, you can get your firewood, and you'll also find gifts. All you have to do is give thanks and, you know, be modest in what you take from the environment. Or if you take something, give something back. Don't be compare bouquet and just take, take, take everything that you can. So this aspect of reciprocity and needing to give back what you give or what you take, that's something that comes to the forefront a lot in ecology. There has to be a give and take. There has to be a balance. And restoration ecology is all about finding that balance and trying to restore it. Scroll, please. So, back to some real life examples. Promise I won't talk in riddles the rest of my um, lecture. I wanted to frame this talk around one of my favorite fruits, um, something that grows wild in Louisiana and that I've studied a lot. This is called wolfberry. The wolfberries are from a plant called Lycium carolinianum. It's often called um, Carolina wolfberry or matrimony vine. They're very, very yummy. They kind of taste like if a cherry and a tomato made a baby. And I'm not talking about like cherry tomatoes, but actually a cherry and a tomato. They're so good. They're very healthy for you. Um, and they grow wild in the marshes and some of the swamps in Louisiana. Next picture. So in the wild, they look kind of gangly, like you wouldn't think much of them. Um, you may see a little flower or a fruit um, when they're blooming. Next picture. But animals love wolfberry. The mammals and the fruit-eating birds, they like to eat the berries, which um, come around in wintertime when there's not a lot of other things to eat. And then larger birds, like pelicans, they nest in wolfberry. So it provides forage and food, but also habitat. And then additionally, the way that the plant grows, it creates this kind of basket weave of its roots, which help stabilize the soil and uh, prevent erosion so that we can keep building land and our habitats can kind of sustain themselves. Next, please. So that's important for folks like me who go out into degraded um, or eroded habitats and we try to figure out how can we get this back into a functioning ecosystem. So we grow plants like wolfberry to put them out into barrier islands or marshes. Next, please. Because uh, where I'm from in Louisiana, we're facing a coastal land loss crisis. The seas are rising, our lands are sinking, and so we're trying to combat that so that we can thrive and continue to live where we love to live. Um, but Louisiana and other coastal states were also the first line of defense for hurricanes and storms, things that protect more coastal or more inland states. And we provide a lot of resources to the rest of the community in the country as well. Uh, scroll, please. One of those resources that people love are our oysters. Um, some people might not be into oysters. I know they kind of look like boogers. Some people refuse to eat them. I love oysters. Um, and 70% of the oysters that are eaten in the United States come from the Gulf of Mexico. Scroll, please. So in addition to just being super tasty on a po' boy or raw or something, um, can you scroll down so I can see the text, please? Thanks. Oysters are also used in what is called living shorelines. So imagine going out to the beach and you're building like a sand castle wall or something to protect whatever you've built or to protect your moat. Scientists actually do something like this in real life. Um, they create structures built from concrete or old oyster shells or sacks of um, bagus or grass and things like that to try to protect the shoreline that might be eroding. And so in addition to actually creating a physical barrier to protect the coastline, uh, the oyster provides 
habitat as like a reef habitat for crabs and fish and other oysters and things like that. So you get a twofold benefit, protection and more habitat, and then more oysters for us to eat. Scroll. So in addition to protecting the land, providing us with food to eat, the culture surrounding oysters is a part of uh, a certain lifestyle in Louisiana, a traditional lifestyle that is in sync with the environment that relies on our coastal waterways and the coastal wildlife that we see there. So you see oystermen who are out there with their tools on the water um, harvesting oysters for us to eat. And their way of life is also jeopardized by some of the environmental changes that we see in Louisiana. So again, we're seeing this connection, this reciprocity is that changes in our environment also affect how we live our lives and how we relate to our environment. Scroll up, please. And beyond just the environmental connection that we have, our relationship with our environment and how that ties into our relationship with food is a large part of our culture that's in jeopardy if we lose that connection to our environment. You know, traditional foods like oysters, um, it's not just the food itself. Like I mentioned, it's the lifestyle, it's the tools, it's the knowledge that you pass on to the next generation. It's knowing where the salinities or the salt in the water is the right level for oysters. It's the language, it's, it's everything that makes up our heritage, um, all tied into our food and how we get our food from our environment. So that could be, you know, gathering sassafras leaves under a full moon to make filet, or, um, next picture please. Gathering pecans during the fall, next picture. Going out to gather uh, frogs in a new moon in the summertime, next. Or crawfishing in the spring. So these are all foods and traditions that are really close to my heart and my culture, um, that if our land and our environment was so degraded, we wouldn't be able to maintain the same way. Scroll. Now, I grew up in Houston, and you're more likely to see one of these, like a KFC, Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, uh, you know, castle, more than you're bound to see a crawfish pond. Um, and that's just the reality of it. A lot of us don't have access to traditional foods or produce um, or these traditional ways of life. Scroll, please. And when you don't have access to affordable, accessible, um, equitable, healthy foods, we call these areas food deserts. And they're often in communities of color, low-income areas, places where people don't have as much access to transportation. Um, in addition to disconnecting us from those traditional ways and being in sync with the environment. Food deserts can also impact our health, um, contributing to obesity and diabetes. Um, you know, these foods are supposed to be treats for us. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I really like my spicy chicken sandwiches and a cheesy gordita crunch. But again, these are supposed to be little treats for us. Um, they're not meant to be how we live our lives and all the food that we consume. And in addition to just being a health impact or disconnecting us from the environment, this type of mass-produced fast food really takes a toll on our environment. Large-scale monocrop agriculture, meaning just swaths of nothing but soybean or fields of nothing but cattle or nothing but corn, you know, that really takes a toll on our water consumption, uh, the quality of the soil, the air we breathe with all that methane from the cows, um, agriculture wasn't the, meant to be that way. It's not sustainable how we do it now. But these fast food giants, they are listening to us. And some of these systems are starting to change in a way that reflects um, a more sustainable future. You know, things like the Impossible Burger, a lot of that was because people said, hey, we want a more environmentally friendly option when we go to these fast food spots. Give us something that takes less of a toll on the environment and is better for us. So, you know, Change is possible. Scroll, please. So where do we go from here, right? You know, are we gonna close down all the KFCs and force everyone to eat frogs and berries? Probably not. Uh, that's not really realistic to just do like a whole uh, fire sale of our current way of life. 
But what we can do is think of ways to shift that culture, to shift the systems, um, so that we can start thinking of more sustainable, environmentally friendly, healthy ways. Because remember, we're all trying to get back to that harmony, that um, healthy links between our ecosystem and ourselves for the well-being of ourselves, as well as for the environment. Scroll. So throughout the day, I want you to keep that big picture in mind, like everything that we do in life, it's not just happening in this little bubble of this is me, this is what I do, nothing else outside of me matters. Everything's kind of interconnected. Um, so when you think about solutions to these challenges that you might face in life, try to think expansively, just imagine how you can go beyond the simple solution, um, and remember that we're all connected, and that's a really great thing. Thanks.